good Sunday morning to you. So glad to be awake and and alive on this Lord's Day and to be able to take this moment to share this time together with you to study God's Word together. I hope that you're getting started with a great day, and uh, I hope you've got your Bible with you and that you would open up to the book of Galatians. We studied the book of Galatians on Thursday night and did an overview, and I didn't realize how much time I was taking. And when we got to chapter six, I looked down and noticed we'd gone longer than I was planning to go. And so I said at that time, we'll come back to chapter six and we'll address it in some more detail, Lord willing, this morning. And that's what I plan to do. I want to talk about responsibilities that we have toward one another, especially towards each other in the local church, since we are set free in Christ. Freedom brings responsibilities. And Paul addresses that in chapters five and six of the book of Galatians. And I want to dig in. I'm looking forward to digging in to verses one through 10 of chapter six and going through and looking at some of the practical applications there at the end of this epistle. This Thursday is Thanksgiving, and I am going to unapologetically be doing what many others are doing spending that day with my family. So I won't be on during the week this week. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be back next Sunday morning and we'll, uh, we'll spend some time together again, studying God's word together. And then Lord willing, the week after that, uh, we'll resume our, our survey of the New Testament epistles. Uh, we do have Thanksgiving coming up and there is so much for Christians to be thankful for. We are living in a pandemic, living in chaotic times. Uh, the numbers are on the increase again. Uh, the positive uh, cases, hospitalizations, all these things are on the increase. Uh, but even in times like this, we still have so much to be thankful for. Here at Knollwood, I've been preaching a series this entire month on being thankful for the church and looking at some different things about the church for which we need to stop and we need to think about it uh, and we need to be grateful for the blessings that we have in the church. Uh, we'll be in Ephesians chapter four today uh, in our worship hour and we're gonna be looking at the work that is accomplished by the church and why it is that we need to be thankful for that. Uh, we are meeting here at Knollwood at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning for a, our Bible class hour, 11 o'clock for morning worship hour, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, for an additional worship hour. Uh, wherever you are, I hope and pray that you are having a great Lord's Day. Uh, I hope that you and trust you'll be putting the Lord first in your life this day and hope that you'll be assembling and worshiping God with his people today. Let's have a word of prayer, and then let's dive into our study this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us a good night's rest and a new day to live and to serve you, to worship you on this first day of the week. We pray your blessings upon those who are hungry, upon those who are hurting, upon those who are struggling with various things, we pray your healing, your peace, your comfort upon them. Please forgive us of our sins, bless our nation, and bless our time of studying together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's turn our attention to Galatians chapter 6, and I, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 to get us started with our study this morning. Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Paul gets right to the, the matter here in talking about some specific 
ways in which we have responsibilities towards uh, those around about us. And in particular, this passage is looking at fellow Christians. Verse 1 presents a, a fellow Christian who is caught up in a sin. The text talks about if a man is overtaken in any trespass. This word overtaken doesn't mean that they have stumbled into a sin, that they have accidentally committed a sin. That happens to all of us every day. This Greek word has with it the idea of being caught in a trap. Here is somebody who has fallen into sin, somebody who has gone into sin, they're trapped in sin. They're in a very dangerous situation spiritually. They need to be rescued. They need to be saved. And as our brother's keeper, we have a responsibility toward them. We have an obligation to go to them and to help them. But notice the text designates those who are spiritual. Not just everyone is charged with the responsibility of rescuing and restoring a brother who is trapped in sin. This important work belongs to those who are spiritually mature, those who are, are mature enough to handle this challenge and to be able to do it in the right way. That phrase, restore such a one, shows us the, the goal. This, this, is, this is what we want. To, to happen. Uh, we don't want them to stay trapped in that sin. We don't want them to be lost and left behind. We want them to be restored. We want them to be restored to their spiritual soundness. We want them to be restored to their service to the Lord uh, in their daily life, as well as in the local church. We want them to be restored to their fellowship with God. They're in serious spiritual danger they need to be rescued. They need to be restored. But notice this is to be done, the text continues to say, in a spirit of gentleness. A spirit of gentleness is needed to carry out this work. Let me ask a question. If you are injured and you are laying in a hospital and you're recovering, what kind of a nurse do you want coming to take care of you? We, we talk sometimes about a doctor's bedside manner. Those things are important to most people. And the Bible says it's important to us as we are approaching someone who needs to be rescued, approaching someone who needs help, we need to do it with a spirit of gentleness. And the text, the verse concludes, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Those who are spiritual must live in a constant awareness of the possibility of falling into sin themselves. And going to rescue somebody, going to talk to somebody about the sin that is in their life is not an easy thing to do. And it poses some challenge challenges. If the person doesn't react in the right way, we can be tempted to fight with them. You know, it takes two people to fight. And if they respond to our efforts in a negative way, if we're not careful, uh, they can insult us and we'll return in like. And the next thing you know, we're, we're in sin as well. And there are any number of things that can happen there. And so when you're going to rescue someone, when you're going to talk with someone about the sin that is in their life, it's a serious matter. It needs to be done, but it needs to be done in a very serious way in a very spiritually mature way. But that's a responsibility that we have now that we are free in Christ. We're not free from our brethren. We're not free from others around us. We have an obligation to them. Verse two says to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, there's a way where these two verses can be connected. A person who is overtaken in a sin who is trapped in a sin, they're, they're in a, a burden. They're in a situation where they need some help. But verse 2, I believe that the picture is changing somewhat. It's not looking at someone who is trapped, but rather it's looking at somebody who is overwhelmed. They haven't fallen into sin. They're simply overwhelmed with life. And you know what? 
That happens to all of us from time to time. Things can happen in our life and things can begin to pile up and the normal responsibilities that we have uh, have, have these other burdens packed on top of them and we feel like giving up. We fall under the weight. We need some help. And that's, that's, that's just the way it is. That's just what happens. There are times when we need help. You know what? There are times when other people around us need help as well. They don't need a lecture. They don't need to be scolded. They don't need to, to be told, now you just sit right there and you clean up your own mess and then you catch up with the rest of us. Now, there are times when people need help. And the scripture says, bear one another's burdens. You put your shoulder to their load and help them while they get back on their feet. It's not a permanent situation. The Apostle Paul is going, to, is going to go on to talk about the fact that we have to bear our own burdens. It's not a permanent situation, but it's a temporary situation. And Paul says that in doing this, we fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, in this, in this case, right here, it is the law of love. Jesus taught that the greatest second commandment was to love our neighbor as ourselves, What we call the golden rule is to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Bearing one another's burdens, helping one another through the tough spots of life. That's how we fulfill the law of Christ. That's a very practical, very easy thing for us to be doing, but we've got to do it. Now, while we're here, I want to look at that phrase, the law of Christ. We emphasized on Thursday when we went through the book of Galatians that, that Paul is making the point, we have been set free from sin. And we have been set free from the burden of the law of Moses. Don't let anyone bring you back into bondage, but stand fast in the liberty by which you've been made free. We are free in Christ, free from the burden of sin, free from a law that cannot save us and all of its requirements. We're set free from that. Don't, don't go and be brought into bondage to that. Again, there are some people who will take these admonitions and they'll carry them out to a conclusion that is not meant to be made. We are not free from all law. We are set free by Christ. But in obeying Christ, we must submit ourselves to his law. We're no longer under a law that cannot save, but we're under the law of Christ. And we have to submit to that, and we have to fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I wanted to put that in as we're studying uh, the book of Galatians. Now, verse 3. Verse 3, Paul says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. A spiritually minded Christian should be willing to help a struggling brother with a burden and not use it as an occasion to vainly boast about themselves or to imagine that they are superior to this brother. Let me come and help you because I want to be next to you because it reminds me that I'm doing better than you. No, that is not a Christ-like attitude to have whatsoever. The Bible warns against having an overinflated opinion of ourselves and of our worth, and the Bible warns against using others as a means of measuring our own righteousness. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus gave a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector going to the temple to pray. And he gave the parable as a lesson against those who would do just what verse 3 is talking about in our text, who would use the failures and the weaknesses of others as a way of elevating themselves and their own worth. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 
Uh, let's start at verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here's the conclusion. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who, hum who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I want you to notice how this Pharisee started this prayer. The first thing he did is he said, I'm better than that man over there. He began to, to talk to God about how great he was by looking at someone else and saying, I'm better than that person over there. That's a dangerous thing to do. You know what? We can always look and find somebody who's doing worse than we are and make ourselves feel better. You know what? I'm better than that Hitler guy. I'm doing much better than him. Lord, I'm really something, ain't I? Where the reality is we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's the standard. You look in verse four, come back to Galatians chapter six and verse four. But let each one examine his own work. Don't, don't look at others. Don't judge yourself by what others are doing or failing to do. And that can be taken both ways. We can find other people who are doing worse than us and make ourselves feel better. And we can find people who are doing what we believe is better than us. And we can beat ourselves up over that. No. Let's look at our own work. Let's see what it is that we are doing with our talents, with our, with our opportunities to serve the Lord. Let's look and examine our own work. Then the text says, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now that doesn't mean that we don't get joy from being with others. What that means is we stand on our own feet. We don't elevate ourselves by putting other people down. We don't use somebody's burden or somebody's sin as a way of elevating ourselves and building ourselves up, no. We serve God as best we can. And we seek his forgiveness when we fail. But we stand before God as individuals. And if we can remember that, then we can rejoice in the Lord. We can rejoice in the Lord in putting forth the effort in living the life that we live as best we can. Verse 5 says, for each one shall bear his own load. This is the way that, that God would have us all to live, that we would bear our own responsibilities. This goes back to, to bearing, one, bearing one another's burdens. There are times when we're overwhelmed. There are times when we, when we need help, but that's the exception. The rule is we are productive members of society and productive members of the local church. We raise up our children. We don't raise up our children so we can take them over to, to get in line to get welfare. We raise up our children so we can send them out into society as productive members of society. And that's what God wants us to be. Let's, let's bear our own load, knowing there may be a time when we need help. But we bear our own load so that we're not a permanent burden on someone else. And we're able to help those who need our help from time to time. That is the responsibility that we have. Our brother who is trapped in sin, our brother who is overwhelmed with a burden, we need to help them. We need to do it with the right attitude. And at the same time, we need to make sure we're not being burdens to others as well. Now let's continue on in verse six. Verse six says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. To stay in this context, to keep this in this context, 
we need to make sure we've got the right attitude towards our brother who is trapped in sin, the right attitude towards our brother who is overwhelmed with a burden. We need to make sure we have the right attitude towards those who are teaching us, that we're not despising them, that we're not taking them for granted, but instead that we are sharing with them and we are helping them as they are helping us. The scriptures teach that the preacher is worth his pay. This is one of the passages in the New Testament that talks about and gives authority for preachers to receive a salary, to receive pay for the work that they do. Let him who is taught share in all good things with him who teaches. The Apostle Paul addressed this matter in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in which for, for a specific reason, he did not take payment from the church in Corinth for preaching to them, but he points out the fact that he had the right to. He had the right to because the laborer is worthy of his hire. Now, I realize that there have been times in the past where preachers have not been taken care of or they have not been paid like they should. I, I've read the books of the preachers from the 1800s who came back from, from being gone preaching and they brought back a couple of chickens. You know, and and I, I realize, that, you know, their expense, they didn't even get their expenses paid. I realize that, that that has happened in the past. I've given my adult life to full-time preaching. I've never had to go to bed hungry. I've never had to sleep outside. I've never been without what I needed. God has taken care of me. Good brethren have taken care of me. And the reason is because they understand the truths that are set forth in passages like this. If we benefit from the work that's done by preachers, and by the way, elders can be paid as well. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. An elder can be paid for his work as well. If, if we've benefited from their work, from them giving their time to helping us to understand, then we have an obligation to help to support them. A laborer is worthy of his hire. So I need to make sure I've got the right attitude towards a brother who is trapped in sin, someone who's overwhelmed with a burden, and the person who's helping me to understand God's word and to grow and mature spiritually. Now, verse 7. Verse 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Verse 8 with it. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This is a great passage of Scripture. We get a lot of mileage out of it in our preaching and our teaching, but first thing let's do, let's, let's keep it in the context. Let's keep it in the context. Paul has said, you better have the right attitude towards a brother in sin. Better have the right attitude towards a brother who's overwhelmed. Better have the right attitude towards those who are helping you. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. If you don't take care of these responsibilities, you're going to be the one who pays for it. That's, that's this instruction in its context. Do not be deceived. The Bible has that warning a number of times in a number of places. We can be deceived. We can be fooled and we can fool ourselves into thinking that we know better than God, that, that, that this doesn't apply to us. Well, the text says God is not mocked. And that, that phrase, God is not mocked, the word mock comes from a Greek word that means literally to turn up one's nose and to treat one with contempt. And the idea really is God says you do these things and you respond by saying, eh, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do, God. That's the idea. As you're, as you're thumbing your nose at God, you're telling him, ah, you don't know what you're talking about or it doesn't matter. You're not going to do anything about it. Do not be deceived. You're not going to fool God. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And if you have the wrong attitude towards your brethren and you have the wrong attitude towards those who are helping you, you're going to pay for it. There's a principle set forth 
it's stated very clearly here, but it's set forth all throughout Scripture that whatever we, we sow, that's what we're going to reap. You reap what you sow. And if you, you spend your life looking out for number one, and you spend your life just, just satisfying the flesh, if you look at verse 8, and doing the things that you want to do from a fleshly point of view, that's what you're going to reap. Don't think that you can live for the world your whole life, and then somehow on judgment day, you're going to sneak by God. It's not going to work. God isn't going to be fooled. You won't be able to do it. So if that's your plan for eternity, thinking that you're going to live however you want to live now, and on judgment day, you're going to catch God while he's looking the other direction, and you're going to run into heaven. No, we're going to reap what we sow on that last day. We reap of, if we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption, eternal corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we'll reap everlasting life on that last day. Now look at verse 9. Look at verse 9, and let's keep it in its context. Verse 9 says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. I'm tired of helping my brethren who are trapped in sin. I'm tired of bearing the burdens of my brethren. No one bears my burdens. I'm tired of taking care of those who are taking care of me. I'm tired of watching the people in the world live for the day and sow to the flesh, and they're enjoying this world to the utmost, and here I've got to deny myself, and I've got to take my lumps now, and I'm tired of that. That can happen. That can happen. This verse reminds us that the Christian life is not a 50-yard dash. The Christian life is a marathon. We're in it for the long haul. We're in it to see it through to the very end. Do not grow weary while doing good. And it can be wearisome to go to Christians who aren't doing right. It can be wearisome to go to people who are overwhelmed. How many times can you go and sit with someone while they weep and mourn? How many times can you go and, and go through the emotional turmoil of helping somebody put their life back together after they've lost a loved one, after their spouse has run out on them, after they've lost their job and, and the, the bills are piling up? That could take a toll on anyone. Uh, the, the person who is teaching in verse 6, sometimes preachers get burnout. Sometimes they grow tired of teaching and working with churches. Sometimes elders get tired as well. So here is an admonition that we all need. Don't grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Harvest day is coming. You don't harvest the, the vegetables that you plant the day after you plant them. No, there's a time and there's a season for everything, and that is true with life. We spend our life sowing spiritual things. We enjoy little blessings along the way, but you know the real harvest is coming on that last day. That last day when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, don't cheat yourself of that reward. Don't cheat yourself of that, of that harvest because it's coming. But if we lose heart, if we grow weary and we lose heart, we will miss out on that. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 3, this book was written to Christians who were ready to give up. They were ready to throw in the towel. And the writer addresses this in numerous places in Hebrews. I like this passage, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Beware, brethren. See, see, beware. That's like what we read in up in verse 7 of our text in Galatians. Do not be deceived. Beware. Here's a, here's a verse that's got a red light flashing to get our attention. 
Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We're going to give up. Beware that you don't have that heart, you don't have that attitude, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, we need each other. We need each other to encourage one another. I'm encouraged by you. I'm encouraged by you from, from week to week. You encourage me to keep on keeping on, and I hope I can do the same for you, and, and we need to do this for each other because the way is hard, and the days get long, and, and we can grow weary if we're not careful. Look at verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That word if shows up all over the Bible. When it does, it indicates there's a condition. Here in our text, we have become partakers of Christ, but it's conditional. If we hold to the beginning steadfast to the end. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. You hang on to it. You see it through to the very end. It's another verse I want to share with you. You know, the way is hard. And it is tough living in this time that we're living in, where you've got so much chaos and so much turmoil happening in the world. And then you add on top of that responsibilities as a Christian. It can be very daunting. It can be very discouraging. We need to hold on. and We need to see it through. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18 is a good refrigerator verse. What's a refrigerator verse? It's a verse that you need to put up on your refrigerator where you'll see it every day. This is a good refrigerator verse. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice, Paul doesn't dismiss the fact that we suffer. We suffer in this world, yes. But what Paul is saying is it doesn't even begin to compare to what we're going to gain at the end. From this text here in Romans 8, verse 18, I believe that the minute we step into heaven, we will forget about everything that we had to do on our way there. It won't matter. The things that we suffer, the injustices that we have to go through, they won't matter. They'll all vanish away. The only thing that will matter is that we got there. So, brethren, don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. Keep on keeping on. Verse 10, we come back to our text and let's wrap it up. Galatians 6 and verse 10, therefore, therefore, because we have responsibilities and because we have a, a, a harvest waiting for us, because we have a blessing that we can miss out on. Remember, chapter Galatians 5 verse 4 said that we can fall from grace. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all to the brother who's overtaken and trapped in sin, to the brother who's overwhelmed and needs help, to those who are taking care of us and teaching us, to the, the people around about us who don't care about their souls and they're only getting what they can out of this life. As we have opportunity, let's do good to all of them. But notice the end of the verse, especially to those who are of the household faith. Our love should know no bounds. We're to love our enemies. We're to do good to those who misuse us. We're to do good for everyone. But there's another principle set forth here. If you're a Christian, you have a love for everyone, but there are some people that need to come to the forefront of your heart, and that would be fellow Christians. 
fellow Christians. We're leaning on each other. We're helping each other to get through. We're encouraging and exhorting one another. So let's look out for one another and let's do good for one another, not to the exclusion of anyone else, but let's let's put our brethren in a special place in our hearts and in our lives. Cain told God, am I my brother's keeper? Well, he knew the answer to that question, and so do we. Yes, we are our brother's keeper. Just because we've been set free in Christ doesn't mean that we're free from one another. We have obligations to one another, and let's be faithful in fulfilling those obligations, knowing that we benefit from it as well. There are times when we need help, so let's be helping one another. Thank you so much for letting us slow down and go through these verses, and, and, and I want to tell you there are sections like this in a lot of the letters in the New Testament where, where they're just admonitions that are that are that are chosen or put together there is rhyme and reason to it uh but there are a different list of admonitions <clears throat> practical admonitions found in these epistles and that's one of the blessings of reading through these new testament epistles is finding these lists like this and they remind us of our daily responsibilities not going to be with you on thursday i'm going to be with my family and i don't apologize for that at all I hope that you're making plans uh, to be with loved ones on Thursday as well. And I, I hope and trust that you're going to spend this week letting your light shine before others. And one of the ways you do that is by being grateful for God's blessings every day. Even in a time like this, we have so much to be thankful for. And when we choose to be thankful, we're letting our light shine. We're making a difference in this world. I'm grateful that you've spent this time and we've been able to study together. I hope you have a great Lord's Day and a great week ahead. And Lord willing, we'll be back together again this coming Sunday at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. I hope that you have a great week.